This video was brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand subscribers to click the link in the description will get 30% off an annual premium membership so you can explore your creativity. The so-called Web 2.0 it could be seen as some revindication of the internet after the wild financial speculation blew up the market in the late 90s in what is known as the dot-com bubble. The new economy. Is it a boom without end? Give them flus. Oh now, my in the aftermath, there was a sense of caution and undeniable optimism for the web's true potential in the future, beyond the savage greed of some investors back then. Social media is probably the primary outcome of that new interactive web, and companies like Facebook or Twitter started building their empires at the early age. Now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. But others did their thing too, like the social news website dig.com. It also rode the wave and had a taste of greatness, just not for too long. Dig was a massive website for sharing news back in 2005. In that boom of the interactive web, it became famous for allowing users to vote for their favorite stories. The most voted would hit the front page, making it a democratically curated news outlet. If upvoting and downvoting contents on the web sounds familiar, it's because Dig was a predecessor of one of today's most popular websites, Reddit. So why is Dig forgotten nowadays? And how did Reddit take over? Let's talk about it in this company, for instance. How this kid made $60 million in 18 months. Dig was an internet darling in the mid and late 2000s. In those years, it grew widely and amassed tens of millions of monthly users who loved it. Kevin Rose was the young founder and he soon made it to the front of the Business Week magazine, which seemed like a big deal back in 2006. He went on rocking a snapback, a goofy smile, two strong thumbs up, and for some reason, a pair of headphones as if he couldn't get off his laptop or something. And over the picture, the now infamous heading, how this kid made $60 million in 18 months. It was a pretty portrait of that pulsing optimism for Web 2.0. Ding had already raised tens of millions of dollars and Business Week reportedly stated on that story that the company could easily be worth around $200 million. It seemed like the ghosts of the dot-com bubble had already faded away. And Dig was a news and content sharing site where users could put together their collections and not rely on the media editor's choices. Other users could vote for the content they liked the most, and the most voted posts would make it to the front page, getting the most attention and the most traffic. Like, you can now upvote or download posts on Reddit. On Dig, you could only dig or bury them. It was an exciting novelty for customers because they had a say in what content could be relevant and popular for the first time. And it was also fantastic for content creators and publishers as it drove significant traffic to their websites. So everybody loved Dig. The dig button that websites craved for back then allowed users to dig content from their site and then let the rest of the community discover it. It was the precursor of the share buttons you see now all over the web with links to all kinds of social media platforms. Sites like TechRadar had anecdotes of how a successful post on Dig would crash their servers with the traffic load in the beginning during the good times. But the same site also reported back then how the traffic they got from Dig dramatically started to plummet and saw a devastating 97% year over year downfall from 2010. Ultimately, Dig went from having tens of millions of monthly users to having a handful of millions in just months. The internet can be a fickle beast, as Kevin Rose himself has acknowledged. But Dig's downfall wasn't just caused by the internet's swinging moods. The story tells that it all started with an ambitious redesign of the site, which ultimately ended up backfiring and attempted against its very own essence and disappointed its community to the core. A killer redesign in a bad way. In the late 2010, while still striving and going through the growing pains, Dig underwent a complete redesign, not just aesthetic, but also on its infrastructure and technology. It was V4 of the site, and it all fell apart. So let's take a tour of the new Dig. There are some definite bugs in there, and the diggers aren't all that amused. In those days, the company's CEO reportedly said that they had a new backend, a new infrastructure layer, and a new services layer, and new machines, everything. And that's all good, but it seems like the timing and the implementation just weren't 
right. They decided to fully migrate their backend to Cassandra's newly released technology and open source database management system. It promised faster loading times and better performance, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. The founder, Kevin Rose, had to admit that Cassandra was still in pretty early stages when they made the decision and ended up struggling with bugs and issues from their site and Cassandra's very architecture. He said back then that they were expecting some bumps while they were rebuilding the site, but the whole thing ended up overwhelming them and the website fell over as they rolled out the new version. But on top of technical problems, they also made some product decisions that pissed off their loyal users, removing some features and adding others that turned the site into what it had shown not to be. One of the main criticisms was that they started featuring content from big news and media outlets going against its independent and free character. People felt that Dig had sold its essence by taking money from these sources, despite them admitting that they didn't take any money from this feature. But the damage was done. User feedback was unforgiving. The people demanded to have their favorite features back and they hated the new features. But developers in the company couldn't think of any features. They were all hands on deck just trying to keep the site function. So things weren't looking any good for Dig entering the second decade of the millennium. On the other hand, sites like Twitter and Facebook were nothing but thriving, letting people do the same they did on Dig and much more. 500 millionth user. Multi-billion dollar idea. Kevin Rose has said that Twitter became a major place to find out what was breaking on the internet. Facebook became a place to share links. Sure thing, social media grew up and it left Dig behind. As they worked to keep the site running and figure out what to do with the product, users had already been migrating to other similar platforms that were prospering themselves, like Reddit. And it wasn't even that Reddit was competing fearlessly or anything. They seemed to even have a kind of friendly relationship. One of Reddit's co-founders, Alexis Ohanian, wrote an open letter to Kevin Rose in 2010. He expressed that the decisions behind the horrible V4 of Dig were pushed by VC investors and not by Rose and his team. He said, it's a damned shame to see Dig just re-implementing features from other websites, but I've got a strong feeling it's not you making the decisions anymore. And to see your baby abused like this must be awful. Indeed, it must be awful as a CEO having gone through a couple of full design and technology changes in Slidebean, I can only imagine the horror of seeing your product kind of crumbling before your eyes like that. By mid-2012, six years after its inception, Dig was sold for $500,000. Has been bought by Betaworks. Used to lead the field in providing community-driven news to millions of online users. That's about $195 million less than the valuation from a couple of years before. Its strepitous fall became a cautionary tale for internet companies at the time, and it almost brought back some fresh reminiscences of the dot-com bubble first. By the way, did you watch our dot-com bubble video? It's one of our most successful videos yet, and I think part of the magic of that video was in the color grading. We had to really up our game on color grading, and truly, the most useful resource we found was a course called Color Grading for Filmmaking by Dan Dan Louie. I knew I was missing some stuff like grading skin color and knowing when on the pipeline is the right time to work with LUTs and with styles. With those skills, we were able to give a 90s look to that dot-com bubble video. We were able to do an FBI interrogation room for the PayPal Mafia intro and that gangster look that we used for the PayPal story. This course and thousands more are available on Skillshare. The first thousand subscribers to click the link in the description will get 30% off an annual premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Even if you've already had a free trial of Skillshare, you can still take advantage of this offer to get a full year of unlimited learning and creative exploration. So let us know in the comments, did you ever use Dig or are you just too young to know what that was? Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next week.